All right, thanks for coming, folks. This is the Sensible BC Tour. Uh, we're here tonight to talk about marijuana, marijuana legalization, decriminalization, what is a sensible marijuana policy, and how can we make that happen here in British Columbia. My name's Dana Larson, and I'm the director of the Sensible BC Campaign, and we've been working on this for several months now to bring forward the idea that British Columbia, and any province really, has the power to decriminalize marijuana possession as a province without having to wait for the federal government to take action. And we've written a law called the Sensible Policing Act. And this law has been approved by Elections BC, is suitable for a referendum and valid legislation within the jurisdiction of the province. And what the Sensible Policing Act does is it tells all police in British Columbia, including the RCMP and municipal police and even the transit cops, to spend no more time or resources on searching or seizing or detaining or arresting anybody for simple possession of marijuana. And that will be a good first step, we believe, towards a sensible marijuana policy. It's not the last step, but decriminalizing possession takes cannabis users off the front lines of the war on drugs, and it helps let police focus on real crimes, and it certainly sends a strong signal that we as a province do not want to pay any more for our police and our prosecutors to waste their time going after otherwise law-abiding citizens for simple possession of marijuana. And so we'd love it if a government of the day would pass this law, but we're really working towards a referendum in British Columbia so that we can, as citizens of the province, can get together, can put our support behind this, and can get this law passed and put into force. But to have a referendum in British Columbia is very, very challenging. It's very difficult to get something on the ballot here, and that's why we've only ever had one ballot initiative referendum in our whole provincial history. To get something on the ballot, we need to collect signatures from 10% of the registered voters in every single one of British Columbia's 85 electoral districts. That comes to over 400,000 people, and we only have 90 days to do it. It's a very short timeline for a lot of people to get signed up. And so our strategy has been to promote this campaign. I've been traveling around the province by myself. Now we're putting on these panel discussions in various communities across the Lower Mainland to build support, to get our volunteers and our supporters in place so that when we come to September, we have a big database of supporters, we have tra trained and excited volunteers around the province getting involved and we're able to pull this massive campaign off. And things have been going pretty well for us in a lot of ways, but certainly it's challenging to get our message out to people, to explain this legislation and how it works and how the referendum system works and how this is going to all come down. But if we work together, we can make this happen. We can change the marijuana laws in British Columbia. People sometimes think that marijuana is already decriminalized in BC and no one gets charged for possession. If you live in Vancouver, that's true. In Vancouver, the VPD lay very few possession charges, less than 10 a year. It's their policy not to bother otherwise law-abiding citizens in possession of marijuana. But across British Columbia, marijuana charges have been skyrocketing. There you go. They've more than doubled over the past uh, six or seven years since Stephen Harper came to power. We're seeing ever-increasing amounts of police resources, especially in British Columbia. They've gone up 30% all across Canada and more than doubled here in BC. And uh, so we're spending twice as much money, twice as much police time, twice as much court resources on dealing with marijuana users. And really, I don't think the people of British Columbia think that's the right way to spend their tax dollars. So. We've got this wonderful panel here to discuss, this, discuss issues around marijuana and to help uh, inform and educate you about where we're at with marijuana policy in British Columbia and what a legal marijuana system would look like. So I'm going to introduce our first speaker tonight. That's Randy Long. Randy's a formal federal prosecutor who brought narcotics charges ranging from street-level prosecutions of drug dealing to trials for conspiracy. He still does criminal code prosecutions on behalf of the Crown Counsel Office for the Ministry of the Attorney General. He's also a lawyer in private practice, a member of the Law Society of Upper Canada, member of the Law Society of BC, and most importantly, a member of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. His background as a community organizer and a Crown Prosecutor has led him to the conclusion that prosecuting narcotics offenses is the wrong approach. He's also concerned about the ever-increasing arrests for simple possession of marijuana and the illicit marijuana market-related violence across North America, especially in Mexico. Please join me in welcoming Randy Long. Dana, thank you very much. Unfortunately, tonight, um, Dana, I've got to con confess, I got nothing. After, after last night and, and listening to everybody talk, I get nothing. I don't have your eloquence. I don't have Derek Corrigan's uh, skill. 
<laughs> but having said that, once you give a lawyer a microphone, he's going to give you a little something. And at least what I'm going to do is tell you about Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. It's an organization made of um, um, law enforcement personnel. As I said last night, we're everybody and we're everywhere. Uh, we are DEA, uh, we are ICE, we're ATF, we are RCMP, we're former judges, former lawyers, and we're actually practicing people within law enforcement. This is a very difficult situation for law enforcement personnel to be proactive in this particular area. And it's not just about marijuana, but it's about drugs overall. Essentially, the message that LEAP has is that prohibition is bad. Prohibition is the problem. It's prohibition that leads to criminalization of otherwise consensual behavior between people. It's the prohibition that we have to stop. It's the prohibition that has created a problem and a market for illegal activity. It's the prohibition that's created the profits. Now, Judge Jim Gray, who's also a member of our, our organization, says that several things have happened with this now 40-year crusade, this 40-year war against drugs. It has been a complete and utter failure. It is absolutely unshakable. The jury is in with every pun that you can intend. It doesn't work. It's been a miserable failure. It, and it's easy money to take, and it's money that it's difficult to walk away from if you're a sensible administrator and if you're trying to fund your personnel and keep people on the street. I can tell you, for example, in Nanaimo, with the so-called Green Squad there, they also use them to do general services policing, which means they do random plainclothes work. But they fund that particular group of individual officers with the money that's available through the federal government. And I can tell you that once you start that money coming in, any smart administrator is going to say, I don't want to lose that funding. I don't want to lose the people on the street. Any clever municipal politician is going to say, well, I want more personnel on the streets, and I can't have the money. I can't get the money locally, so we're going to go with this particular area. We're going to let the feds fund us. We're going to take that money. We're going to use it, and we're going to use it wisely. That's a good theory. Here's the reality. This becomes a statistic-driven means of law enforcement. We go out and we make arrests. It is not a surprise to me as an officer of the court and somebody who's practiced law for 22 years that some of the most challenging and provocative developments in the law having to do with search and seizure have come as a consequence of drug enforcement. It's cowboy cops. I'll tell you tragically that what I've seen are good people come into court saying, hey, uh, yeah, I smoked a little marijuana. I, yeah, I, I, I realized that wasn't a good idea, maybe outside the bar, etc. but, you know, I'm not a criminal. Well, I got news for you. There's a big old machine that says, yes, you are, because part of it is the economics. They make money by processing you through this system, and we know story upon story upon story of people who have been processed doesn't hurt, it's just business, okay? Don't worry about it. Except that coming out of that, minimally, you're going to get a criminal record. And horribly, tragically, you could wind up in jail. The movement of the federal government today in the legislation that's in place is to put people in jail. Now, it leads to some interesting, interesting contradictions. And again, Mayor Corrigan last night said some I thought some very impressive things. He talked about his time as a defense counsel, and he talked about the standard patter that he used to use when he went into court. And he, he told the story about being in front of a judge and the judge saying, oh, yes, Mr. Corrigan, it's you. Standard patter, yes, uh, Your Honor, standard patter. Standard result, yes, Your Honor, standard result. Fine, fine, fine. Away you go, business as usual. Well, I want to tell you an example. For me, listening to Derek talk about that, that meant something to me because I knew exactly what he was saying. Let me tell you anecdotally something. I sat in Euclid, provincial court there, lovely place, beautiful city, town, a lot of us know about it, and I watched provincial court take place. And I watched a man who was 67 years of age stand up before the provincial court judge with 
Crown Counsel, the federal prosecutor there, saying blah, 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 marijuana. The gentleman said, yes, Your Honor, blah, 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 marijuana. I'm 67 years of age. I've never had so much as a driving offense. I don't really believe that marijuana should be illegal, and I really don't believe that I've done anything wrong, Your Honor. I'm sure you're going to know better, and you're going to be able to help me out here. The judge turned to the prosecutor and said, Mr. Prosecutor, what is it? $350 fine, Your Honor, $350 fine it is. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, said the gentleman on, on his way out. $350 fine and a criminal record. Next man came up, he was in his mid-30s. Much the same thing, a little more active, kind of saying, Your Honor, I just saw what happened there. I, I, I got news for you. You know, I don't believe any of this stuff and, and, and I'm not impressed with you either. Boom, $300, $350 fine, criminal record, thank you very much. Now, I was seated <coughs> next to a friend of mine, a colleague, a defense counsel, and I'm seething, watching this disgraceful performance take place. And I'm saying to him, you do something or I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna jump up, I'm not gonna take this. He said, whoa, 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 whoa. I've got one of these coming up, calm down. I said, you better do something about this. He says, I got it, I got it, I got it. He stands up, introduces his client to the court, introduces, of course, himself to the court and says, your honor, thus and so, thus and so, thus and so, conditional discharge. The judge says, yes, of course. That's the pattern that Mayor Corrigan was trying to tell everybody last night. I'm going to tell you a little more succinctly. If you ever happen to be in front of the judge through any unhappy set of circumstances that you found yourself on the wrong side of possession of a marijuana cigarette, remember the thing that you need to know is a combination. That judge, like other law enforcement personnel, has made an oath he or she is obliged to uphold the law. Now, I want to back from that just a half step and tell you anecdotally, flash back to another occasion, occasion in court when I'm shrieking at a provincial court judge, telling him my client is a good person, a fine neighbor, a law-abiding citizen. This possession of marijuana is nonsense. And the judge effectively, almost word for word, said to me, I got it. Stop yelling at me. I got it. What am I supposed to do? I swore an oath, there's only so much that I can do. Well, you're gonna do the minimum? Said, yes, I'm gonna do the minimum. Okay, I'll shut up. The minimum was done. The point that I'm trying to make to you is so often I see kids, and I mean this, kids, 18, 19, 20, 21 year old kids saying, ah, $350 fine, I guess that's cheaper. And they blindly go in and they take it. They take the fine and the criminal record. Don't do that. Here's a, here's a quickie lesson. Remember that in the criminal code, there's such a thing as the discharge provisions. Stand up to that judge, to him or her, say, sir, madam, your honor, my lord, my lady, pick a title. I don't care what it is. But say, this is a most embarrassing and unhappy experience. There's a lesson that I've learned, and I'm going to keep my counsel to myself. But the one thing I do want to assure you that this is a profoundly distressing situation for me. It is in my best interest not to have a criminal record. It's in the community's best interest that I don't have a criminal record. And as a consequence of that, I would really like you to consider the discharge provisions of the criminal code. And let the judge help you. Not that the judge is a nice person because of. Don't forget, we sometimes make the stereotype that in law enforcement, everybody's blind, everybody's stupid. Everybody, as my colleague Peter Chris said, true believers. It's a religious experience. No, it's not. I'm standing here to tell you that we all know intuitively, without having had the opportunity of hearing these conversations, judges, lawyers, sheriffs, cops, Everybody has had some moment of misspent youth, some moment of proximity to marijuana. It is one of the world's biggest hypocrisies to think that they haven't. And bear in mind, the people who have real world experience and the people who are in law enforcement, by and large, are good people. There is an oath, that's the one thing that sticks them. There is that economic logic. I'm just doing my job, everybody chill, this is just professional. Now, don't let them off the hook. Challenge them, challenge them. But I like what Mayor Corrigan had to say when he said, yeah, sometimes I found people in court that just weren't quick enough and uh, 
sincere enough to apologize to the constable. Don't forget that that is an issue when you're dealing face to face, at front line law enforcement. But the idea that there is no crime in simple marijuana possession is just not true. That's not gonna make it, that's not gonna save you. The very thought that it's just discretion with individual investigators that's going to save me is not enough to give me comfort. That's what I like about Sensible BC because it's turning that around. The plan to change the Policing Act actually says, no, 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 no. Your function, your obligation is not to bother people for simple marijuana issues. Your obligation is to be law enforcement and deal with real crime. That, or real crime. That's what I like about sensible, sensible BC and some of the proposals that they've put out. The second thing that I really like about Sensible BC is we're no longer relying on the law enforcement personnel. Take it into your own hands. We're no longer relying on the politician. All due respect to Mark sitting here, Mayor Corrigan, and Joy, my colleague who was a city councillor. All due respect to the sensible thinking politicians who are out there, and I say, Give them the opportunity to help you and to help themselves, but don't rely on them. Take this message, take this into your hands. Here's some of the problems that we have. When we do federal prosecutions, historically, the liberals are in, and I'm not looking at you, Mark, but I'm talking to you. The liberals go in, the liberals guys come in, and that's the liberal law enforcement people, the liberal federal prosecutors. Conservatives come in, the conservative federal prosecutors come in. A little bit like Washington, one side of the street. My guys are in, my guys are out. That's the way it works. When I did federal prosecution out of Nanaimo, it was essentially a $200,000 a year business. It was paid by the hour, $200,000 a year. Now the territory is a little bigger. Today, it is a $2 million a year business. There's not more crime. There's simply more prosecution. Be very clear about it. It's more profitable. Part of the problem that we have with prohibition is creating illegal markets, creating so much profit, not just for the ostensible bad guys, but tragically for the good guys as well. I want you to try and bear that in mind, and I also want you to reflect on a couple of things that I learned last night. Sometimes we take this so seriously that we get paralyzed, that we can't do anything about it. I've got to tell you, one of the treats that I had last night was listening to Mason talk about what they did in Colorado. And one of the lessons that I took away from his talk is that they had fun. They seemed to be having fun. They challenged things on an outrageous kind of basis and they won. So if there's another message to be said, my observation from the court system, from law enforcement is, challenge things. Don't despair that it can't change. I wouldn't have believed up until this point that we'd be this close to change. But don't forget, have some fun. Enjoy this thing. Challenge and move this thing forward. And I'm confident it's going to succeed. Thanks very much, Dana. Thank you, Randy. And that's excellent to get that, that perspective that we often lack within our own movement from those who are on the other side or dealing with prosecutions and that. Uh, it's definitely very fascinating. Uh, our next speaker is Joy Davies. Joy's been politically involved both as an elected official and as a member of many government committees since 1984. She was elected to Grand Forks City Council in 2008. Due to the tragic suicide of a dear friend who suffered excruciatingly painful symptoms caused by erith erythromyalgia, Joy became an aggressive public advocate, lobbying the provincial and federal governments to decentralize the MMAR program to the provinces, asking for dignified, legal, local, affordable access to medical cannabis. Joy now lives in the Lower Mainland and continues her advocacy as the director of the BC Medical Cannabis Partners, and she is a federally licensed cannabis patient. Please join me in welcoming Joy Davies. No, nope, I'm gonna need help, Dana. <laughs> All these tell guys are on me, you know. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. 
Thanks, Dana. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, and thank you, Dana, for hosting all these around the province. We need so much education. There's a, a giant disconnect about what's, what's going on and be, between recreational, that doesn't kill anybody in the whole world, and medical and being able to access it. Uh, we seem to live in a time of, of um, compassionate people, people who care, medical people who care. Um, we as a group, um, we're patients and patient advocates. We are non-profit, we're non-funded. But we want to see our governments honor what they were charged to do way back in 1972 that they have not done yet. And that's through the Ladane Commission and one of the recommendations is that the provinces under health, which is their mandate, take care of their sick people. Um, this has not happened. Um, even in uh, 2009, the Nolan Commission, you know, stating the same type of, uh, of um, situation needs to help as well. So I'll bring this down a bit more. I was never a recreational user of cannabis um, or alcohol. I didn't smoke, smoke cigarettes. It just wasn't me. My... Um, I was 54 years old when I was um, five years into fibromyalgia um, on 13 different pharmaceuticals and basically dying in bed. Uh, I had friends that, would, that came over one day with some joints and they just said, Joy, we love you. We don't want you to die. You need to do this. And I listened, and I hacked and coughed because cannabis is a natural expectorant, which I didn't realize. I thought it was just because I was ingesting. And it's been a 10-year journey, and I'm not on any uh, pharmaceuticals at all. Um, cannabis is my only uh, medicine. I've actually gone to one-fifth of what I, was start, what I started to use um, in, in the beginning. I vaporize, I bake, I use oils. Um, and those are my primary uh, ways of ingesting my medicine. When you're sick, you don't get the kind of high that most people get who are not sick. And, and, and our society doesn't understand that either. Uh, I get really relaxed and I have a sense of well-being and I know my body is healing because my goodness, I'm here and I'm not dead. When I had uh, doctors would ask me, well, what's your, your pain level, one to 10? And I'd say 2,050, every cell in my body is screaming. And I can truly say today I'm down to about a one or a two. And I probably have more stress in my life because I'm so angry at the government that's allowing and continually creating violence and abusing people who are so vulnerable. I put together a few posters, our group did. Um, the middle poster is actually a memorial to my friend Priscilla. Um, as Dana explained, she passed. That was actually taken the day before she died. Um, and it happened to be the night that I was uh, installed to city council. And we were dear friends for many, many years, and I miss her. Um, but her doctors, in 10 years, she suffered with erythromyalgia, and they put her on every pharmaceutical you could possibly believe. And when you get sick, you become isolated, you lose everything. And she ended up with biomechanical problems, and in the end, the last year of her life, she was actually crawling on the floor. It's the only way she could get around. And I took her the uh, Compassion Club papers, as well as Health Canada papers, three years before she died, and to take to her doctors, because, my God, Priscilla, look at me, I have a life, you saw me before, you know, <laughs> it works, it works. And she took them to her doctors, and they said, no, absolutely not, you're not having cannabis, but we'll put you on methadone. And that's what they did, they put her on methadone. Uh, she became addicted, hello? Could you have a choice? No. And it took her um, nearly a year to take herself off the methadone. Um, I thought I suffered with a lot of pain. I knew that she was in comparable levels. And she simply lost hope. She was um, six weeks before her 60th birthday. And um, I phoned her the next day after we were installed at council and no answer, email, no answers. Next day, same thing, repetitive, and I had a horrible, heavy thought, feeling, and I knew something was wrong. And I phoned friends, and I said, please call the RCMP, something's wrong. And they did. And the RCMP went to her suite, and um, they found her in the bathtub with a beautiful blanket that she had made. She was a BC uh, Quilters Association top quilter for three years. And candles everywhere, and she left a note, remember me the way I was. 
And that's how she was gone. She took over leftover Macedon and she took her life. She couldn't continue to live with the excruciating pain that she was in. And Priscilla is only a representative of the thousands of people in our country who are taking their lives because they have lost hope for whatever reasons, be it through depression, be it through diseases where you don't have uh, a relief from it. Um, I get really angry this year, and I have a lot of anger in me, and I know that, and I try to do positive things with it. Uh, anger at government. Um, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. We have people that want our government to legalize euthanasia. And my goodness, they're talking about it. But they won't let them have cannabis. Cannabis is the medicine that would relieve them of their symptoms so they would want to live. They would have a quality. Where does this disconnect come from? Why would you even think of legalizing euthanasia when you don't give people the opportunity to try a natural plant that's never killed anyone in 5,000 years? And believe me, in our society, if anybody died caused by cannabis, it would be over every media that you could ever find. And it's not there because it doesn't happen. We've been propagandized for 80 some odd years. And we need to break that disconnect, and that has to come from each one of us. At my age, and tomorrow I'll be 65, and I've been involved politically for 30 some odd years now, and I've seen a decrease of our societies and our individuals' involvement in anything to do with government. We don't even vote anymore. 24% of the available people to vote in the last federal election elected this majority government that we have now. That means 66 people, 66% 66 of the people didn't vote, if my math is right, and I'm not great at that either. <laughs> Close enough? Close enough. 76, 76. Close enough. Okay, Close a enough huge, huge number of people didn't. I have a joke. I'm now a um, senior blonde fibro fog menopause post-concussion person. So when I can't get it, I've got a big excuse. <laughs> so just laugh along with me on that. But anyways, we have a huge disconnect. We're not involved. The government's, you know, I got involved because I realized, where does all my money go? It goes to government. I want to have a say in it. So I started getting involved in community and, and grew from there and uh, ended up with three turns on council. With Priscilla's death, happening and it was actually um, four years ago this month that I made my first motion to City Council to decentralize the medical marijuana program to the provinces where I believe it belongs and keep it right across Canada but and have the federal uh, banner still there for legalization. Um, our group is now in, in six different provinces so there's it's starting to spread. Um, but as a, a person elected to represent my community, you, you don't have the luxury of being a special interest in my heart. I don't believe you have the interest of being non-controversial. Hello, we have to be controversial if we're going to get the job done. Does that mean we'll get reelected? Mm, nope, not necessarily. In fact, two of us in the province who were the most vocal, and we did get the resolution through UBCM and FCM in 2010 and 2011, neither one of us got elected. And I have to think of that. I mean, okay, I'm in a little town. I understand it. I had both sides of the team against me, the guys who were totally moral judgmental and the ones who were making a lot of money. They just didn't want to see what was going on, and that's cool. But my, my colleague, uh, Philippe Lucas in Victoria, was an incredible counselor and did so much in a big city, and he didn't get reelected either. So it does show what's going on in our society. We don't want controversy. And I think that's also why nobody's voting, is because we our government is not relevant to really what's going on in our society. And cannabis and medical cannabis is one of the biggest things in my mind because it leads and opens the doors to so many other things that are relevant to the communities that we all live in. There's also another poster up there, uh, the one that says Harper Stop the Abuse Now. Um, we end up with our law enforcement abusing our sick people. I mean, they'll, they'll come to the home, and this gentleman here had a cere um, cer I'm not cerebral palsy. My mind just went on me. Help. It's, he's got... Um, Muscular dystrophy? 
Did I say? Okay, he has cerebral palsy. He's in a wheelchair. He can't even feed himself. He had a friend do it for him. He's under a doctor's care and uh, applied to Health Canada for the, his license to be legal because it really helped his disease. And the next thing you know, there's a SWAT team at his door pushing him away ripping out his little garden. My God, you SWAT team for a man in a wheelchair? But that's, that's what we see happening all the time. Uh, on Vancouver Island a couple of years ago, I, I read an article where seniors uh, were in bed at 10 o'clock the night, SWAT team at their door, pounding their door down. And they were, somebody told them, these guys are growing pot. So they forced the old folks out of bed, took them into their garden. There was a whole bunch of tomato plants. When does it stop? In Alberta, it was, I think it was marigolds about last year. Daisies. You know, they couldn't tell the difference between a daisy and a pot plant or tomatoes and a pot plant. A desert daisy, oh, excuse me. <laughs> you see my point? We are disengaged. I, I believe we've been so totally desensitized and we need to educate people. We need to have our province and our politicians stand up and to accept their responsibility under Section 56 of the uh, CDSA is where our provinces can work with our federal government and do bilateral pilot projects, which is where government likes to do things, and create good regulations and legislations to allow dignified access of sick people to this medication, increase the economy of the provinces, keeping things local, uh, keeping everything safe, but they're not doing that. And I was really hopeful, and those that have been around me know that this last month we've been going crazy busy with our team because we, one of our MLAs who's in a position to make announcements said he would make an announcement to strike a committee for the province to set parameters for medical marijuana program. And it didn't happen. And I look at everything that's happening around Christy Clark and that and understand I heard my MLA on the radio today. Oh yeah, I now know what he didn't happen, but I haven't given up hope. We've got a petition that's starting and I hope you check out Avaraz next week. We'll enjoy our petition and get those numbers up. But it's up to you as well as us here to make the difference and be part of the solution. And, and I'm really grateful again to Dana for his decrim things. This is so important. Why are our kids being criminalized for this huge lie we've been lied to forever? When I first did the pot, that's when I realized, oh my God, it's not a gateway drug. It's the lies that's a gateway. With the kids taking this, they know there's no harm. So let's try the next ones, ecstasies and, heart and, and heroines and things that can, for a growing brain, really do some damage. It's the lies. There's nothing wrong with this plant. And I need you to tell all your friends, there's nothing wrong with this plant. It should be in every part of our lives. The new science that's coming up now where they're juicing the leaves, there's no high whatsoever and the medicine is incredible. You wanna get rid of your brain tumors, your breast tumors, you better get on cancer and not listen to those doctors who don't know because they are like this. And there's lots of different reasons and, um, and I don't want to be judgmental, it's the society we live in, but we, it's got to come from us and lift up. And, and it's hard because you're going to get moral judgment from your friends and your family. My mom um, and dad ended up divorcing over pot after 25 years. And in the end of her life, which is two years ago, and I gave palliative care to her, she was, our relationship was hard because of her moral judgment on cannabis. But I took her through the last four months of her life only on cannabis tea. She stopped throwing up after the first little container and she had lost 35 pounds in less than three months. In a week and a half, she put 10 pounds back on because she stopped throwing up. All of the pharmaceuticals didn't work and she had an appetite. So I got to cook all of her favorite meals for the last four months, that was our joy. And in the last two weeks, her journey, and I wish I could share it all with you, which I can't, was so beautiful. To the other side and spiritual, I'd never seen anything like this. Uh, we had home support every day. They said their other clients with lung cancer and dying of other diseases on morphines were seeing snakes, had spiders crawling all over them. They were terrified of going to the other side. My mom saw little cherubs and children, and she saw gold thread coming down so she could sew. 
I don't care if it was a slight hallucination or if it's really what she saw. She was in the hospital less than 14 hours and before she passed, and her journey was peaceful, and she went to the other side. Yet all of these people that came to care for her, none of them have ever seen anyone use cannabis during their end of life. And that's a message we need to get out to everybody we know. Even with our, um, I know, know I deal with a lot of politicians, uh, um, uh, specifically municipal, or sorry, um, MLAs provincially, and this report of the fire chiefs that have gone across Canada and implemented into our, the brains of our politicians that, oh, everybody that grows pot is, is going to have fires and we're going to be faced with rifles. And, and I, uh, this is the words coming back to me. It, it's, it's got holes all through that. I mean, it's less than 5% of the licensed people that, grow, that, that's, that abuse the system. Yeah, when I went to my doctor to get a renewal, a new doctor, the change, it's a very tough system to get through. He knew I was going to renew. I met him last August when I moved here. In January, I said I have to come get a renewal. Took him the forms. Three weeks later, I don't have anything, and I'm panicking because I know it's 12 weeks to get through the system. And I go in there, finally, you know, and I'm phoning, phoning, no answer. Finally went in. I says, okay, Milan, I need to have my papers. And he says, well you know that 80% of everybody that grows, they sell. And I just couldn't believe this guy. This is a doctor. I mean, we, it's supposed to be no harm. And I said, well, I don't sell. You know my work. And for God's sakes, it's not 80%. Where did you get numbers like that? But patience, this is, this is what we face is patience. And he says, well, I have to read it over. And I said, you've had it for three weeks. If you don't sign, I'll never get my license by the 9th of March. It's already becoming too late. He signed the papers. It went to Health Canada. Two weeks later, it comes back. They want to have a specialist report. And I'm going, oh my God, they've got my specialist report. What the heck are they talking about? And I wasn't going to monkey around. I went down to my member of parliament's office. And I said, please help me with this. I got such a an attitude from the staff. Well, my friend's son was in a car accident because some other guy was in a car driving and he was smoking pot. And I says, what's that got to do with me? But that again is the misinformation that's out there. And she did her job, got it in. I get a phone call from Health Canada the next week saying, oh, Miss Davies, we're really sorry. We made a big mistake. You don't have to get in your or a specialist report. And remember, it takes a year to get us back into an appointment. And I says, well, that's great. So what's going on? Well, just, just give us the date of your, your, your specialist report. And I says, well, I don't have that. You've got that. And they says, oh, yeah, I'm a little disorganized. And I said, I said, so what do you want me to do? Well, you did it after 2001. And I said, yeah. Well, maybe, I don't know, put down July 21st, 2002. I'm saying, are you... And I wanted to say the F word. I didn't. Are you kidding me? I did what he said because I need my license. But here we are legislated and regulated by these people in Ottawa, and they're making so many mistakes and telling us to lie. Hello, the hypocrisy, the disconnect. So this is now the 15th of March. I'm sorry, folks. I am legally a criminal because my license has not arrived. I, am, I have my grow. I am taking care of myself. Um, you could report me, and they'd probably come to my door. I've obviously, I've contacted my MP, my member of parliament again, and I said, it's on your plate. This is your business, this is your government, and this is what you're doing to the rest of us. And this is not as big a problem as I have seen with so many others. So I could go on for hours with stories. I, I, stories. I ask that you check out... Um, some of the facts over here. For those of you that will become involved in different things, I suggest there's three videos you check out. Um, if you need more history, and this is great videos to share with your friends. Uh, what if cannabis cured cancer? And uh, Peter Coyote is a narrator on that. The house I live in has just come out, and I've never seen anything so powerful. And I can't recommend strongly enough for you, everybody to see this. And you will see why the drug war isn't working. And for those who say kids shouldn't have any medicine, 
check out Charlotte's Web and Jacob's Journey, two children with epilepsy. This medicine is not a panacea for everything. I'm really glad that we have pharmaceuticals. You don't, it didn't help me at all when I had kidney stones pass the, the uh, cannabis. It doesn't work that well for acute pain. And thank God, I had, it's the first time in my life I had an OxyContin, but it took care of the job. And uh, we're not trying to say pharmaceuticals go out of business. We're just saying give us our lives, give us our dignity, allow us our choice under the charter. When we live in a country where our government tells us what food we have to put in our bodies and controls the source of that in our medicine, we're living under tyranny. Scary word. Never thought I'd hear that word or say that word in my lifetime. Knowing how my dad fought in the war, came home with shrapnel and, and uh, shock or um, post-traumatic stress syndrome, uh, knowing the millions of lives that have lost because to keep our freedom, and yet we have very quietly allowed this to happen. We really need to wake up as a society. We need to have Dana's program and everybody involved and get this decriminalized. And then hopefully down the road, all these doors that are opening slowly will end up with legalization with a program that again respects us as human beings and people. Thank you for your time. Yeah, you're setting up the thing. Uh, and certainly, you know, as someone also, I also break the law on a regular basis, uh, selling marijuana to people who need it for all kinds of medical purposes. And I see every day the amazing medical benefits of this plant and all of its forms and the people whose lives it really improves in so many ways having access to that. And uh, you brought up the, the Section 56 exemption, and that's the part where the federal government or the Minister of Health has the power to designate any person or class of persons as exempt from any aspect of the control Drugs and Substances Act. That's the, the, that's the legislation that was used to allow the insight to first start operating. And that was the legislation that was used with the first medical marijuana patients to allow them to be exempted from that system. And we're calling for the same kind of thing in British Columbia. The federal government could give all of British Columbia an exemption under Section 56 for us to do what we choose as a province, to try an experiment here and see what it looks like if we try to legalize and make marijuana legally available and to sell it and allow adults to grow it for their own purposes. So it's totally within the federal government's power to let British Columbia try an experiment and go our own way. And that's part of what we're calling for with the Sensible Policing Act. Our next speaker is Mark Elias. He's the president of the Liberal Party of Canada in Vancouver East. He's also served there as vice president and communications chairman. As a liberal activist, Mark has taken part in shaping Liberal Party policies and promoting them throughout Vancouver, including, and our focus tonight, is the new Liberal Party policy to tax and regulate marijuana. So let's uh, welcome Mark Elias. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank everybody here for showing up, and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I know this picture is dated. Mark Arno just stepped down from the leadership race. All right. This is an exciting time to be a liberal, uh, simply because we're actually having a leadership race that has been open to the general public. You can, if you've already registered as a supporter, you can actually vote for the next leader of the Liberal Party. Uh, I'm also going to be talking about our policy to legalize, tax, and regulate cannabis. But first, I would like to talk about our opponent's uh, views. Uh, here's Stephen Harper's comment to... Uh, this is at the Summit of the Americas. He's clearly stating that the war on drugs is a failure, right? But... On March 12, 2012, B Bill C-10 passes. And what is the whole point about B C uh, Bill C-10? Sorry, A very clear message from our uh, Justice Minister saying if you're involved in any sort of cannabis stuff, you're going to jail. Uh, these are the minimum sentences that the Government of Canada has in place. If you have six months, uh, six plants, you're going to jail for six months. If you are caught trafficking, you're going to jail for one to two years. Possession for the purpose of trafficking, a year or two as well. Those are minimum sentences. And as you can see, there's a whole bunch of other minimum sentences as well. 
Now, uh, our other opponents, the NDP, they're, they're a little divided. You know, you actually have uh, Libby Davies, my member of parliament in Vancouver East. She's actually for cannabis uh, ending prohibition, actually. They want some reform. And there's a lot of NDP members who are for cannabis reform. But unfortunately, their leader isn't. Okay, this is a statement uh, not too long ago, about a year ago now. Uh, this is his statement regarding decriminalization, not even legalization, okay? Where we actually have our own policies and we actually have a long tradition of wanting to end prohibition. Our leaders were ahead of the party. Uh, the reason we haven't been able to end prohibition, is, well, the fact is it's, it was taboo, all right? We're not gonna sugarcoat it. <laughs> it was. Here is a comment. Can anybody guess who said this? I don't know what marijuana is. Can anybody guess? Exactly, it's Jean Chrétien. And he was actually talking about uh, decriminalizing marijuana. His government, he wanted to lead his government into decriminalizing marijuana. We all know what happened over there. There's also uh, another tradition. In 1972, the Ladane Commission was commissioned by Pierre Trudeau, and Pierre Trudeau also wanted to end prohibition, but the party did not support him on that. But in January 2012, we had our convention. This is a convention where we actually opened it up uh, to you the public, you were able, we decided then that you were able to vote for us, uh, our leadership candidates, okay? But more of our delegates actually voted for this to, we have a new policy to legalize tax and regulate cannabis, 77%, basically four out of five, okay? Uh, one of the main reasons was because two out of three Canadians support legalizing cannabis, okay? But a real hot issue is the violence related to prohibition, okay? This is a statement by the city of White Rock. This stuff happens all over BC. Uh, and it happens more regularly than people would like to think. So that's part of the problem. There's also another issue, uh, prohibition of cannabis in Canada and the United States and globally uh, brings in other drugs and weapons into Canada because our weed is good. We actually <laughs> export it, okay? Uh, and these gangsters are bringing in guns and cocaine, heroin, uh, things that we do not want on our streets, okay? We don't believe that decriminalization is a solution. We actually believe ending prohibition, legalizing and taxing regula uh, and regulating cannabis is the way to go, all right? And another one of the benefits is that we're actually looking at earning $4 billion in tax revenues every single year, okay? That's money that can be used for law enforcement, better border protection, healthcare, money that we could use for a lot of different things. $4 billion a year is actually not chump change. Uh, it also will create jobs, okay? You've got jobs in the obvious agriculture sectors. Uh, you've got government jobs who can go in and inspect stuff, accounting, transportation. There's actually a list of jobs uh, that we've actually were able to compile. If you go to bc.liberal.ca, you can find our paper and it will be in there. Uh, will people be able to grow in their ho own homes for personal com consumption and private use under a liberal government? The answer is absolutely yes. All right, and there's other public health benefits. We can make it easier to prohibit youth access, uh, ensure that marijuana is grown in a controlled and regulated setting, uh, delivering billions of dollars of new revenues that governments can spend to reinvest in public health care, and other stuff, all right? Encouraging the private sector and ac academic, uh, academic organizations to expand research into health impacts, et cetera. These are the five best reasons to end the current prohibition. 
fighting organized crime, more revenues for governments to spend, all right? The current law does more harm than good, and that's what the Liberal Party is about, is evidence-based policies, that's right there. Legal drugs like alcohol and tobacco are just as harmful, if not more so. And uh, again, our commitment to evidence-based policies. One thing that you should do, support Sensible BC any way you can. Tell all your friends about it. Get them to sign up uh, as a supporter. Help uh, Dana out. We are at the Liberal Party, so anything you ever need from us, don't hesitate to call us, you know. And, uh, you know, we want you to join us, all right? Please donate to the Liberal Party, okay? We could not do these uh, policies without you, and we need to get back into government because Harper's taking us down the wrong path. And uh, the way you can do that, liberal.ca. Thank you again for your time. Uh, I know it's not as passionate as uh, Joy's or Randy's uh, speeches tonight, but this is where we stand, you know, and we think that you should vote liberal if you like evidence-based policies, and this is one of our evidence-based policies. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And that's part of the dialogue we need to have ultimately is what kind of laws are we going to have around legalizing marijuana? You know, there's a pretty broad consensus, especially in British Columbia, that prohibition is not working and that the war on marijuana has failed and whatever its goals might be. But what are the details about how we can legalize it, how we deal with that? And it's great to see the Liberals talking about that and doing that work and bringing that debate forward. And I absolutely applaud you for that. Um, our final speaker tonight is Mason Tavert. He's the Director of Communications at the Marijuana Policy Project, and he co-directed the campaign in support of Amendment 64, which was the successful statewide ballot initiative in Colorado to regulate marijuana like alcohol. He's also directed the campaigns in support of the successful Denver ballot initiatives to remove all penalties for marijuana possession back in 2005, and then to designate marijuana as the city's lowest enforcement priority in 2007. Mason is also the co-founder and former executive director of Safer Alternative for Enjoyable Recreation, SAFER, and a member of the Marijuana Majority Advisory Board. He was named by the Denver Post, Colorado's top thinker of 2012 in the category of politics and government, and was recognized by High Times Magazine as the 2012 Freedom Fighter of the Year. He's here to tell us how they changed the laws in Colorado and what we can learn from their example here in British Columbia. Please join me in welcoming Mason Tavert. Thank you guys so much for having me here. It's uh, really been, uh, I'll leave that up there for a minute. Um, do I need the microphone? Are yeah. we recording through the microphone? Can I take the microphone off the stand? Sure. I should have done that. Yeah. <laughs> Suckers. <laughs> that would have been easier. Uh, well, yeah, thank you so much for coming out tonight on a Friday night to, to hear from all these great speakers. Uh, obviously, everyone's got their own, their own reason for being involved in this, and I'm sure you all do, too. Um, mine is because, quite frankly, I just do not think that we should be punishing adults who are making the rational, safer choice to use marijuana instead of alcohol if that's what they prefer. Um, I, I would strongly encourage the Liberal Party to, that last slide, I was with you the whole time until that last slide where it said marijuana is no more harm, or is just as harmful as alcohol and tobacco, maybe less harmful. Oh, no, I don't think <laughs> I said that. Yeah, no, I you can said clarify. if not less. You said if not less. It's way less. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not calling, I don't want to call out Mark. I just want to, you know, like, I, I think that, you know, we definitely need to just, one of the things we need to do is, is we do need to be honest about marijuana and the, you know, it's, it's, 
obvious that uh, our, our prohibition policies aren't working and that uh, they're causing more, more harm than, than good, um, but it's also just incredibly obvious that marijuana is a relatively benign product that has never killed anyone, as, as you know, Joy referenced. Uh, it's less addictive, it's less toxic, it doesn't contribute to violent and aggressive behavior. Uh, I don't think that we see people getting completely baked and you know, slapping their wife around. It just doesn't really happen. Um, so if marijuana is objectively a less harmful product than alcohol, why on earth would we prohibit people from using it instead of alcohol if that's what they'd want to do? It's, it's insane. It's bad public policy. And so that has been the message of an organization that I helped start back in 2005 in Colorado called SAFER. And the whole message was simply, you know, was just trying to get people to accept the fact that marijuana is safer than alcohol and it needs to be treated that way. Because unfortunately, a lot of people still don't know that. Uh, in, in the United States, I can't speak to Canada, but in the United States, about only, only about one third of Americans uh, have typically, at least at that point when we started, uh, acknowledged that marijuana is safer than alcohol. About a third thought they were equally harmful, and about a third said that marijuana somehow, I don't even know how you could arrive at the conclusion that marijuana is somehow more harmful than alcohol. Um, but what we do know is that the people who do actually understand that it's it is a safer product. Uh, they overwhelmingly support making it legal and treating it that way. So uh, we set out to convey that message. You know, we we recognize that there are all sorts of great messages in support of ending marijuana prohibition. The fact that it's it's you know giving money to cartels and gangs instead of to legitimate businesses. Uh, the fact that it is, uh, you know, we, we see illegal growing taking place in national forests that are hurting the environment. There, uh, you know, we could make it harder for young people to get their hands on it. We could be generating tax revenue. These are all great arguments in support of it. But if someone thinks marijuana is as harmful as methamphetamine, tax revenue ain't gonna change their mind. So um, we wanted to get that message out and what we decided to do, this was immediately after I graduated from college, is we decided that we were going to go to college campuses in Colorado where there wasn't really any marijuana reform activity taking place and we were going to start organizing college students and just, you know, putting ballot measures on the ballot in, in, on college campuses where they had campus referenda uh, questions that simply said the students don't think that the, poli the penalties for marijuana should be any greater than for alcohol on campus. And they, you know, the goal here was not necessarily to change campus policy. We knew that that probably wasn't going to happen. You know, the, the administrators probably not going to listen to the students when they vote to reduce penalties for marijuana. But we wanted to force that conversation and we wanted to force them to explain why they would rather students go to fraternity parties and binge drink instead of sit in their dorm rooms and you know, play Xbox and smoke a joint. Um, why? We wanted them to have to answer that. So um, I'm going to try to stick to the theme of bashing elected officials, um, <laughs> which we've, we, everyone's been criticizing elected officials, at least in some capacity. So um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm joining and I'm going to pile on too. Um, so, uh, you know, it starts with, with, with administrators on college campuses. They ignore these votes. They say, oh, we don't have to, you know, they say, well, marijuana is illegal and alcohol is legal. So we, we, we don't think that we need to change things. It's like, well, how many college students are over the age of 21? Not that many. So, you know, most of them are 18, 19, 20. We, we just highlighted how silly this is. Um, and we just really forced a conversation. We started getting media coverage, and that was the goal, to get this message out there. And it was really successful. Uh, we, we were in the news. We had college students, you know, standing up saying, let us make the safer choice. And we decided that it was, this was something we needed to take to the next level. So uh, we went to the city of Denver, the capital in Colorado, and we decided we were going to run a citywide ballot initiative to legalize marijuana. And everyone said, well, that's, that's ridiculous. It's not going to win. And we said, we, we don't really care if it wins. That's not really the goal here is to force the discussion in public about this issue. And we're gonna get something on the ballot, and people say, well, you're probably not gonna get it on there. You don't you know, have that much money. So whatever, we can get it on there. We're gonna force people to talk about this. And so we, we did. We went out, uh, me and one other guy, um, 
we, the two of us, by and large, with a, a couple, a handful of volunteers, uh, went out, we collected the signatures needed, and we got on the ballot. And the whole, you know, the whole purpose of this campaign, like I said, we didn't expect that we were going to win. Um, no city in the world had ever voted to remove all the penalties for marijuana possession. It's just never happened. Um, so we got on the ballot and we, we weren't trying to make friends necessarily. We weren't going and trying to encourage, you know, people to, to tell them what they want to hear and to, you know, kiss ass and say, oh, you know, uh, like we don't want to mess with this person or that person because we might lose votes. We just wanted to make this conversation happen. And when someone said that they were against it, we really fought back and we didn't accept it. And one of the people who we, uh, well, we had a couple of situations. Uh, one, you know, there's, there's some people here who were, who were around last night, so I'm trying to change it up a little bit. Um, so the, the, uh, the, our primary opponent, and who has now become the biggest foil for marijuana policy reform in the history of the world, is uh, John Hickenlooper, who is the now governor of Colorado at the time he was the mayor of Denver. And this is a guy who made a fortune off of beer. He had a brew pub, it was the first brew pub in, in Colorado, and it was, you know, he had his hand in restaurants, he was selling alcohol, he was making a fortune, and that's why everyone loved him. Oh, he's the guy, you know, he's the guy that you want to hang out and have a beer with, he's the normal guy. And he came out while we had this initiative on the ballot, and he said he was opposed to it. And he said, no, marijuana is dangerous. We can't, we can't have it be, be legal. This is a guy who's probably sold enough booze to kill thousands of people a hundred times over. And so we, you know, a lot of people said, don't, don't criticize John Hickenlew. I mean, don't criticize John Hickenlew. This guy's popular. Everyone likes him. All the, you know, the Democrats are going to be opposed to this. Don't do it. And we said, well, you know, we, we don't think we're going to win anyway. We don't really care. So we're going we're, we're gonna to criticize him. And so... Uh, in addition to last night's talk, I now get to have some visual aids. So, so the first thing that we decided that we would do is, uh, is we decided that we would talk about John Hickenlooper the same way that John Hickenlooper talks about people that sell marijuana. He's a drug dealer. So we decided that we were going to label the mayor as a drug dealer because that's what he was. He was selling a drug and making money off of it, just like people who sell marijuana are doing it and making money off of it. And of course, people couldn't believe that it was happening. Um, let me see how I make this up. So basically what we decided to do, we, we basically planned this out. We said, okay, we're going to call the mayor a drug dealer. How are we going to do this? It's like, I'm going to be on TV in the morning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop this bomb, and we're just going to like see if, if it gets picked up. And so this is, uh, this is the bomb. Is, the, is there going to be audio on this? I didn't, oh, if I hold that, yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's see if this works, hopefully. Is it... It's, uh, I think it's because it's like loading. Um, shift all time. <laughs> no, I think it's just because it's, um, cause it's loading. So, um, mm, should I or am I going to like set it back? R refresh? Okay, take a vote. That's the theme of the night. We're talking about referendums. Okay, we're going to refresh. What's the Liberal Party stance on refreshing? <laughs> We're always good. For always good for refreshing? Yeah. Oh, there we go. I think that, you know, it's unfortunate that this is the... Okay, we got to start over. Okay. So, let's go. 
started with Ellen. Final well, thought from you. I, I think that, you know, it's unfortunate that this is the way the domestic violence community feels because if it is actually their mission to prevent these acts from ever occurring, they should be behind this because there's no doubt that if adults used marijuana in this city instead of alcohol, there would be far less domestic violence, and that's just a fact. The mayor doesn't agree with you. Well, the mayor happens to be a drug dealer, but he is fortunate. A, this, oh, you, a drug dealer? He sells his drug in an in illegal market. He just happens to be lucky enough that our laws consider his drug legal, and despite the fact that it's deadly and leads to domestic violence and oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah maybe the videos are going to be kind of tough mm. yeah mm. well and despite the fact that it's deadly and leads to domestic violence and marijuana does not he's able to profit from it and i we're, think we're going to end right there uh, <laughs> i can see some response from the mayor's office about Chicken. that so, so yeah, we're, we're going to end right there. Um, and so the, the, the last thing he said, which you might not have heard, is he said, oh, we're, we're probably going to get a response from the mayor's office on that one. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so, you know, the mayor, the mayor came back and, you know, they decided to poke fun at it. And, and, you know, the chief of staff for the mayor's office said, oh, you know, we're not taking this seriously at all because no one supports this. And, you know, we're going to send them a, you know, a bunch of Doritos and Oreos for their next meeting and the, the munchie <laughs> joke and... You know, and, and if, you know, we decided, well, okay, you want to keep this going, let's keep this going. And, you know, we did, I did some more media that, that, that night. We did a big press conference, big sign, said, you know, what's the difference between Mayor Hickenlooper and a marijuana dealer? The mayor made a fortune selling a more dangerous drug. Um, and then, uh, you know, we, we went out there with a big body bag, a fake foot hanging out of it, the mayor's, the mayor's beer products all over the place, and it said the harm of alcohol. And then we had another sign that said the harm of marijuana, which a bunch of Doritos and Oreos over here. And, you know, we really just didn't let him get away with it. And throughout the campaign, we had, we had these kind of shenanigans going on. And ultimately, you know, it resulted in a really big uh, discussion occurring in the city and, and across the state and ultimately across the country about marijuana and whether it's safer than alcohol. And that's exactly what we wanted. But lo and behold, we won. We ended up getting about 53.5%. Um, Denver became the first city to legalize marijuana. And, of course, we had the state, you know, people saying, well, you know, the state said, well, that's great, but we're going to still enforce state law. So, you know, first we had these administrators saying, you know, marijuana is illegal, so we're not going to change things on campus. And then we had, now we got the state saying, well, it's illegal at the state level, so we're not going to let you change it in the city. Okay, so now let's, let's try to change state law. So we set out to run a statewide ballot initiative. Again, everyone's like, you know, it's too hard. You're going to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars just to get on the ballot. It's going to be impossible. You don't have the resources. Uh, you know, people just aren't supportive enough. And we said, well, that's a good argument about the resources, but we don't really give a shit if people aren't supportive enough. That's why we're doing this. Um, and so we, 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 you know, scraped together everything we could. We, we raised some money and we managed to make it on the ballot. And that was when just the the floodgates opened and and the just the shenanigans came rushing in. I mean, we had all sorts of opportunities and we took every opportunity we could to really just highlight the fact that marijuana is safer than alcohol. Um, we put up billboards. We, um, we, we had one in particular, which I'll mention, uh, uh, John Walters, do people in here, I know some people know John Walters, is he was the US drug czar under George W. Bush, and a raging asshole, worst guy ever. Um, and so he was coming to Colorado, and he was opposing the initiatives, that's what they do, they, he came and released the, the National Drug Control Strategy in Denver, you know, they offered a few kids at a home extra dessert to come stand with him, and... Um, <laughs> You know, so all oh, these kids are all, you know, they're all going to become marijuana addicts if we do this. Um, and, you know, we didn't know, we never know when he's going to show up. He's kind of like Jaws, you know. It's like, you don't know where he is, when he's going to pop up out of the water. It's just all of a sudden, like, John Walters is going to be in town tomorrow. And fortunately, at this point, the media really likes us because we are making for some good television. And so they, they start sending us the press releases from the drug czar's office, like, hey, did you hear he's going to be here tomorrow? Like, what are you guys going to do? Um, and so we had uh, the, fortune, the good fortune of purchasing a billboard just to, quite frankly, just to mess with him. Uh, and he showed up the day that it went up. 
And it was a billboard that was based on an advertisement that he created, that the drug czar's office created, that we decided was, quite frankly, a very good advertisement for us. Uh, so we made a billboard out of it. And let's see, hopefully this one, let's see if it's... The billboard refers to a government-produced television commercial that portrays pot smokers as slackers. An actor says marijuana is the safest thing in the world. Now, the new billboard attributes that statement to the drug czar because his department approved the ad. I never said that. What I said to you today is what I tried to say, tried to, say to fill that blind spot. Marijuana is the single biggest cause of substance abuse problem among illegal drugs in the United States today. The ads that they were running telling people how dangerous marijuana was were not having any effect. And now the drug czar has resorted to simply acknowledging it's a relatively benign substance, but you're a loser if you use that drug. At South High School today, the drug czar announced Colorado has received a federal grant for drug prevention and addiction treatment. Of course, they, they hand out these small little grants and, you know, so look, we're trying to prevent teen drug use. But yeah, so I mean, we, we were just, you know, doing a lot of these types of fun things, putting up billboards and so on. And during this whole process, um, we still had this mayor who was asked about the initiative once again. And once again, he said he was opposed to it because marijuana was just so dangerous. And so we decided that we were going to call him out on this once again, but what are we going to do? I mean, we've, you know, we've, we've called him a drug dealer. That's old. You know, the, we need something new. So we, uh, we came out and we, we, we pulled this one. This November, Colorado voters will decide on Amendment 44, a measure that would legalize small amounts of marijuana. The man leading the charge for legalization is challenging Denver Mayor John Hickenlooper and Pete Coors to a duel. Mason Tavert says that he'll be waiting for Coors and Hickenlooper outside the Great American Beer Festival at high noon tomorrow. And for every alcoholic beverage they consume inside, Tavert says he'll smoke marijuana to prove once and for all his claim that pot is safer than booze. If it's true that marijuana is safer than alcohol, we think it's time that these guys put their mouths where their money is and explain why it's okay for them to sell a more harmful drug than marijuana. Pete Coors couldn't be reached for comment. Mayor John Hickenlooper is going to be out of town, it turns out, tomorrow. But he also did respond to the first challenge, quote, you've got to give this guy credit for his creativity. He'll do anything to get himself and his cause in the media. Take it. So we continue to hassle the mayor. Um, so, you know, we run this whole campaign. Uh, Whereas we had previously had just, you know, a, a couple handfuls of, of, of volunteers, at this point now we've got about a thousand, you know, several hundred volunteers. A um, thousand, that means that, you know, there's like 300 that actually show up and there's about 100 that actually do shit. I'm sure everyone's going to be within that 100 here. Um, but you've shown up and that's, that's the, the, the first part. So. Um, so at this point now we're starting to, you know, build support. People still are saying, you know, it's not possible, you're not going to win. But we start finding out, you know, oh, hey, you know, this editorial board, the Colorado Springs Gazette, real conservative uh, paper, they, they endorse the initiative. We're like, holy shit, like, these guys are, you know, taking this seriously, awesome. Um, so we, we start getting, you know, endorsements here and there. Uh, we start getting, you know, a few elected officials here and there. We don't have nearly as cool of elected officials uh, as a lot of yours here in Canada, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but we, uh, you know, uh, former elected officials usually are now willing to come out and talk about it. And, um, you know, things were moving forward, but it came to election day and we lost. And Nothing surprising. I mean, we had been told we were going to lose. We knew we were going to lose. We'd seen polling showing we were going to lose. We just wanted to make sure we got 41%. You know, we were in the 40s. It was, it was, it was you know, not bad. And, and we ultimately had millions of dollars. And if we had paid for advertising um, in, in the amount of television coverage and the amount of uh, newspaper coverage and the amount of radio time, we, we had millions of dollars in advertising that we, you know, I think that billboard was like 3,000 um, bucks. 
we put ads in newspapers. Uh, uh, we had one that you know had George W. Bush's face on it, and it said, you know, tried to fight his dad while he was drunk. Um, we had one that had uh, Dick Cheney on it, said try, uh, shot his friend in the face while he was drinking, and they all then had the little like another reason to vote yes on 64 uh, and or 44 at the time. Uh, we had we actually and then we had a whole page on our website of of rejected billboard ideas, uh, which is where the real good shit was. Um, like I think we had like a Mel Gibson one on there. It was like, you know, like made anti-Semitic comments while drunk or something like that. Um, so, you know, that, that'll be the, the Florida legalization strategy is the Mel, Bill, the Mel Gibson billboard. Um, so, you know, we, we just, we, we really just took the opportunity to have some fun with it and to engage in these types of creative things because the goal was to get people talking about the issue. We knew we weren't going to win. We knew, you know, we didn't have to like appease people. We weren't trying to suck up to them. We just wanted to get them talking and we did. We, we did some creative stuff, some controversial stuff. And as a result, people, you know, the news wanted to cover it, but also people want to talk about it after they saw the news. And that was the goal. So, you know, we lose. Marijuana is still illegal in Colorado, which sucks. So what are we going to do now? And we wanted to keep the narrative going. We couldn't run another statewide initiative right away. So we ran an, an initiative uh, in the city of Denver. Um, this is, I think this might be one of the, the last video uh, here. We ran another initiative in the city of Denver to make marijuana possession the city's lowest law enforcement priority. And essentially, you know, you need to stop enforcing state law in the city. The voters have made it abundantly clear that they do not want you to do this. Um, who do they ask for an opinion on the subject? <laughs> They ask the mayor, and the mayor once again says marijuana is just too dangerous to make it a low priority in the city. So, last video. A new attend tonight, someone dressed in a chicken costume greeted people attending tonight's Dialogue with Denver Forum with Mayor John Hickenlooper. The chicken carried a sign asking, what's so scary about marijuana? group behind the chicken wants the mayor to address why police have made more marijuana arrests since Denver voters passed Initiative 100, which made possessing an ounce of marijuana legal in the city of Denver. So we just didn't let this guy go, and, and we just constantly, you know, had this stuff happening, and everywhere he went, and, and, you know, he's trying to talk about, you know, other issues. They're like, well, what do you, know, what do you think about this marijuana thing? And he's just like, ah, I do not want to talk about this. Um, but, you know, we ran the citywide initiative just to keep things going. Uh, part of it was we said the mayor has to create a panel uh, to, to an implement this lowest priority initiative. And, you know, we brought it to the city attorney when, you know, going through the initiative process, they're like, you cannot do this. Like, the, the mayor is an exe in the executive branch. You know, you cannot direct him to do something. And we said, oh, well, you know, the mayor wants to, like, you know, get on TV and debate it. Then let's, let's do it. And, you know, I said, okay, it's fine. You can have your panel. Um, so then we said, well, yeah, we want to pick two of the people on the panel. And they're like, okay, no, 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 you can't do that either. And we said, well, let's, let's, let's argue over it and, and get public about it. And, uh, you can have your panel, that's fine. So ultimately, we did create a panel to uh, make marijuana the lowest priority in the city of Denver, which um, I was one of the people and my colleague, we were on this panel. And um, yeah, I got a nice sweet certificate that says I'm on a mayoral panel dedicated to making marijuana possession the lowest priority in Denver. Um, and, you know, the, the narrative continued. And by this point, we had, you know, people expected that initiative to win in Denver because, well, we already know Denver is supportive of legalizing marijuana. And we, you know, after passing that initiative, we, we did see that uh, police were still making arrests. And now the newspapers, some of them that were criticizing us and saying, oh, you know, this is futile, this is silly, they started writing editorials saying, oh, the voters have spoken, the, the mayor needs to do this, they need to change. And it was like, okay. This is more like it. Uh, so, you know, this last year comes up. It's, you know, 2012. And when we started in 2005, we said, we're going to fertile the ground. We're going we're gonna to get people primed so that at some point, maybe 2008, maybe 2010, 12, 14, at some point, they'll have heard so much about this that they're going to be supportive. And so we, we, we put another initiative on the ballot this past year, Amendment 64, to regulate marijuana like alcohol, to make possession of up to an ounce and growing up to six plants legal. And we, we qualify for the ballot. This time around, we have a good chance of winning. So we did have some money behind us. So we get on the ballot. And, you know, we did have to be a little more buttoned down, so to speak, uh, in order to ensure that we could win. But we did, we were still very aggressive. Um, you know, the mayor, or 
Now at this point, Governor John Hickenlooper, um, he comes out against it and we issued a statement just saying this is the most hypocritical statement that we've ever heard from an elected official, which says a lot. And, you know, lo and behold, uh, there were the editorial board editor of the Denver Post who had criticized us in the past for calling him a drug dealer, wrote a, a column saying, you know, this is hypocritical of the mayor because he sold alcohol. And it's like, sweet. Like, now all of a sudden, you know, this is sunk in. People are now starting to, 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 to think this way about marijuana. Um, and at this point now, we've got thousands of volunteers all over the state. We've got elected officials getting on board. Uh, we ended up getting, I didn't mention this last night, but we did, um, from the bottom up, get the endorsement of the state Democratic Party or actually not the actual endorsement, let me explain. So we wanted to have the Democratic Party support the initiative. So what we did is we went to the precinct caucus level. We had caucuses where you know it's very small groups and we had people go and we had them bring forward resolutions in support of the initiative. And they, they passed, then it went to a bunch of county caucuses. We had a bunch of people go to the county caucuses and, and vote in support of these, and they passed. And then it went to the state assembly, where the state assembly, uh, the party adopted a platform with a plank in support of the initiative. It passed. We announced that we had received the endorsement of the Democratic Party, and they said, you know, the, the like 20 people who are on the executive committee are like, well, it's not an endorsement. We have to approve it for it to be an endorsement. It's just official support. <laughs> now, if it had been two years ago, I would have delivered a thesaurus to the Democratic <laughs> Party, but we were buttoned down at this point. So, so at this point, you know, we are, again, we're being told that this isn't, you know, Coloradans aren't ready, this isn't going to pass, uh, it's never going to work, and we, 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 we did everything right, we ran a really strong campaign, we had a lot of volunteer support, we really encouraged people to talk to their friends and family about the issue, to get people, you know, helping, and we ended up seeing that uh, we had a significant amount of, of support uh, all across the state, whereas in a number of counties in 2006, we were in the 30s, we had like 35, 36%. We ended up with like 55, 56%. Uh, when we started the Latino vote, we had about, uh, uh, about 35 or so percent. We ended up with 60. And just, just by going on, on Latin radio, we, 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 we uh, went on Spanish language radio, we bought ads on Spanish language, and we just reached out to these people. We made videos to reach out to these communities and so on. We, we did some billboards. We had one uh, woman who was like probably in her 50s, and it said, for many reasons, I prefer marijuana over alcohol. Does that make me a bad person? Um, <laughs> And if fortunately, again, we, we've been very lucky. Um, the, the location we found is literally above a liquor store. And so it says, like, I prefer marijuana over alcohol. I was like, ah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. <laughs> We, 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 you know, we had one with a, you know, a father with his arm around his son and said, please card my son because I need help keeping marijuana out of his hands, stuff like that. And, and you know, ultimately, um, we, we received more support than we'd ever seen before. A lot of organizations that had previously said, we don't want to be talking about marijuana. We don't, you know, it's too, it's too scary. We don't want to drag ourselves into that. And elected officials who had previously said, I don't want to, you know, it's just not worth it. They, they got behind it and we ended up winning. And we, we received 55% of the vote to legalize marijuana in the state of Colorado and, you know, to really make history and to, to send a message. And that was one of the most important parts of this is that it did send a huge message uh, that was heard around the world. It was heard, um, you know, in Europe. I was in Europe shortly after uh, the election and people were talking about it. It was pretty granted. I went to Cannabis Cup in Amsterdam, but I also they were talking about it in other places, too. Um, <laughs> And, and ultimately, you know, one of the things that came, you know, we, we passed the measure and, and they went to the governor, of course, and they said, well, what do you think about this? And he's like, well, and, and he said, and you might have even heard this because it's now become like this world famous quote. He said, people in Colorado shouldn't break out the, uh, the, the goldfish and Doritos yet or so, Cheetos and goldfish. It was, it was like, dude, same fucking joke, man. Like, come on, get some new material. Um, but, you know, like, and he's like, well, the federal government, you know, the federal government's not going to allow this. Federal government's not going to allow this. And here's where we are now. The governor issued an executive order in December officially making possession of up to one ounce of marijuana and growing up to six plants legal. It is now officially legal under state and local law. The federal government has said, we cannot deal with that. That's fine. It's legal. We can't force them to do anything. Um, he issued an executive order establishing a task force 
unfortunately, I could not force myself onto. Um, but uh, we did have a representative on there. She said, but we, he created a task force to create regulations for a legal system of marijuana sales and cultivation. Um, then he had to actually go to our attorney general, Eric Holder, in the Department of Justice and ask for permission to do this and to tell them, like, oh, you know, I'm just here to, to, to say my state's legalizing marijuana and, you know, here's a memo on how we're doing it. And, like, it's like, yeah, you're working for us now, motherfucker. Like, so, you know, it's like we had this, just this evolution and, and, and the way it came about was just forcing people to have the discussion. And that's what's so important, you know. So, I, I mean, I'm going to wrap it up here, but, I mean, basically the moral of the story is that we, we – didn't ever set out to win per se. We really just went out there to try to force people to talk about this issue. And you know, when it started, we had no volunteers. People were like, well, it's not gonna do anything. And then we, you know, that won and some more people got involved, but people still said, well, it's not gonna do anything. And by the time it got toward this last initiative campaign, people were like, this could do something. And it has. And now we're waiting to hear from the Attorney General in the United States. Uh, he is still reviewing the initiatives. Like, it's been since November 7th. If it takes that long to review a five-page ballot initiative, there are serious problems going on. Um, but quite frankly, I, I, feel like, I feel pretty good about it. I think that they're going to come out and they are going to let this happen. I can't guarantee that. I don't know. But um, it, it seems like we are definitely in store for a significant change. And I hope that that change will inspire some change in Canada. Obviously, there's so much support here. Like, there's so much support here. And we had to try to get the public to appreciate that marijuana should be legal. Like, people already appreciate that here. Uh, a lot of elected officials do here, which we certainly don't have. Um, but, it, you know, it's just for some reason it's not important enough. I don't know if, what, the, what the deal is. Like, uh, and, I, and obviously you guys think it's important, that's why you're here. And you know, I would just say that the most important thing you can do is to share that with people, to let them know this is happening, this is important. Um, because if they aren't hearing about it and if they aren't being encouraged to, to get involved, they have no reason to. I mean, it's, it's just, it doesn't seem necessary. And so, I, you know, quite frankly, I would say, like, peer pressure works, you know? That's, like, the one thing D.A.R.E. had right, is, like, when you, like, peer pressure someone, they do shit. So, like, if you say, like, dude, you're not going to fucking help the sensible BC can? That's, that's not cool. Um, hopefully they'll get out, and they'll, they'll actually do something, and they'll help out. Uh, you know, you should tell them, like, hey, do you want to tell your kids that when marijuana was being legalized in Canada, you didn't help? That's not very cool. Like, you know, definitely like lay the guilt on them and make sure that they know. I mean, um, and, and you know, and there are great, there are stories, you know, we've heard some. I mean, we've, we've heard, you know, Randy talking about the courts being clogged up and how ridiculous that is. That might appeal to your conservative friends who think we're wasting money. Um, you know, Joy talking about how she had trouble getting her license to use medical marijuana. Like, the whole concept of having to get a license to use marijuana to save your life is absolutely ridiculous. Um, if you needed a license to, <laughs> if, there, if there's a drug that they should require you to get a license to use, it should be booze, okay? But then every elected official in the entire world would have to have every person that comes to their fundraisers get a license to do so. <laughs> it wouldn't work. So, you know, another reason why. Uh, you know, the tax revenue is certainly one. And, you know, again, you know, people might say, well, it's going to cause all these problems. It's not worth the tax revenue. Well, it's not going to cause all these problems. We don't need to hide and say, oh, you know, marijuana, yeah, it is. It's not, it's not healthy. It's not okay, but we'll make tax revenue. No, just say, listen, what's the problem? We know that marijuana does not cause all these sorts of serious problems that we see with a lot of other things. So what is so scary about an adult simply possessing a small amount of marijuana and using it for recreation or relaxation or as a medicine of all things? Um, so it's, it's, it's absurd. People understand that already here. They know it. They just need to be encouraged to do something about it. And they need to know that while they may not be getting arrested, there are other people getting arrested. And while you know, they may not feel like it's costing them anything, it actually is because, you know, as Randy pointed out, the amount of money being spent on law enforcement is absurd. So, like, you know, reach out to them. 
whenever you can. And this campaign is going to give you those opportunities. They're going to be in the news. There's going to be stories about it. You can forward it to someone, forward it to your parents, forward it to your you know, brother-in-law, say, hey, did you hear about this? And start a conversation with them. And that's what's going to result in the change here in, in, in British Columbia. I think that the Sensible BC campaign is doing everything that needs to be done to do this. And it's not going to be easy. It's, it's not going to be easy. Um, but it's totally doable if people do it. So, you know, I hope that everyone here will, will do it and will get involved and help out. Um, being here is obviously a great, a great first step in that. And I hope that people are very, very active throughout this process. So um, I thank you guys so much for having me here. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I, I am looking forward to seeing how things progress. And, and I want to do whatever I can to help as well. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mason. And I, I really love hearing Mason speak because it inspires me and makes me feel like we're actually going to be able to succeed in this campaign. You know, when we first launched, we first had the idea for Sensible BC about a year ago and started planning on it and writing the legislation and trying to make this happen. And we launched in September. And we've had amazing support from the media. The Vancouver Sun has endorsed us in an editorial. The province newspaper has endorsed us. Black Press has run editorials all around the province. We've yet to have anybody officially come out and say this is a bad idea I'm against it not a single elected person not a single journalist not a single person of any kind of authority has come out directly against our campaign but the challenge we have often is apathy and the feeling that it's not going to make any difference that oh it doesn't matter what we do because Stephen Harper is going to crush it anyways and that fear I hope that that Mason's talk and the victories in Washington and Colorado where they're facing uh, equally if not more hostile federal government but they've managed to make these changes and you know it's not just those two states when California legalized medical access to marijuana in 1996 there's been more than one state a year on average legalizing medical access to to marijuana in the US through ballot initiatives and that is really what gave me the idea of doing sensible BC like I said before I'd love it if our political leaders in British Columbia would pass this law and there's no reason why they shouldn't but it seems to me that there is not enough support within the within our political leadership to make this happen and certainly with the election that's coming up provincially we should be working on all of our candidates at every single party making sure they talk about this issue making sure they take a stand on on this issue whatever it is let's understand very clearly where our political leaders are on this issue when it comes forward but it's frustrating when the mayors and councils across British Columbia vote to support decriminalization and legalization of marijuana when all of the media in British Columbia supports it when the public opinion polls show 60 70 80 percent support for legalization of marijuana depending on how you ask the question I also do not always understand why it is that our political leaders are not getting ahead on on this issue what are they afraid of I can understand when it doesn't have a lot of public support but you think it's the right thing to do you got to make those decisions but when the right thing to do is also the popular thing to do it's supported by all the media it's supported by local government across the province there's nobody who would complain if our political leaders if Adrian Clark or Chris or Adrian Dix or Christy Clark chose to take action on this they would only get applauded and get support from people all around British Columbia so I'm opening the floor to questions to myself or any of our panelists. We got about 15, 20 minutes. Oh, we got some questions already. Excellent. We're working on the pre-written questions. So I'll just start with number one here from Corey. The question is, is Sensible BC's goal to end prohibition? And are we asking for marijuana to be removed from the same schedule class of drugs as heroin and cocaine? And I can take that because it's about Sensible BC specifically. Our goal is absolutely to end the prohibition and decriminalization of marijuana possession is only a first step, but it's something the province can do ourselves without having to wait for change from the federal government. So that's a good first step, but our goal ultimately and the legislation we're passing doesn't just decriminalize marijuana. The Sensible Policing Act also forces the Attorney General of British Columbia to call upon the federal government to change the marijuana laws or to give British Columbia an exemption 
And they can do that by taking cannabis out of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, putting it into the Food and Drug Act would be a great place for it, or under as a natural health product, perhaps regulate it in that fashion. That's what we're looking for. But even if they don't want to take cannabis out of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act right away, they can give British Columbia an exemption under Section 56, which would let us also as a province do what we choose to do as a province. But ultimately, I believe that if we can change the law here in British Columbia with this first step, it will spread across Canada in the same way that we're seeing the victories in Washington and Colorado have emboldened many other legis leg legislators across the U.S. There's more referendums coming up. They're hoping to do something in, in uh, Alaska in 2014. They're working in many other states, but also a lot of elected officials who I think were nervous before about bringing forward this. They knew it was the right thing to do, but they were afraid. But now they're like, heck, they just want it over there. We can do it here in our state too. So that is very important and an excellent question there. Um, uh, our next question is, how likely is it that the government of BC will change the marijuana laws considering the lucrative seizure and forfeiture laws that provide a windfall to the police and the government? And I might take, let Randy address that a little bit, but I will just say that absolutely the seizure of property is becoming a way of funding prohibition and it's happened more in the US, but policing and prisons for profit is coming to Canada as well. And in our province, over the duration of the provincial liberal administration, they changed it so that originally if you're convicted of a crime and they could show that your assets were bought from the proceeds of that crime they could then take your stuff then they changed it that they could do civil forfeiture where you don't need to be charged or anything they can just take you to civil court and in a civil court it's not beyond a reasonable doubt it's on the balance of probabilities so if it looks like you probably did something that was against the law they could then take your stuff without ever charging you for a crime then they changed it even more than that so that if it's under I believe about five thousand dollars seventy five hundred dollars that take your I'm not sure if you were talking about the same thing or not. The, the, the police in British Columbia have the power to seize your assets up to, I think, around $5,000 or so without any kind of trial, without any kind of thing other than a bureaucrat signing off on it. So no judge is required at all. If a cop thinks you have too much money in your wallet and you're probably a drug dealer, they can take that with very little oversight. And this has gone to great extremes in many American states and is something that is a real concern. You know, police should not be motivated as to what they're going to get out of it when they bust you or not. And what this kind of thing leads to is, is, is targeting who's got money. Murderers and rapists don't have money, but marijuana growers and dealers and people involved in the drug trade have money. So they get prioritized and targeted by police forces that want to seize their homes, that want to seize their assets to fund further policing. And, uh, and so that is definitely an issue. But I guarantee that the revenue get generated from a tax and regulated marijuana industry would absolutely dwarf any of these kind of asset seizures being done by the police. Do you want to talk about that a little bit too? Or, no, you're good? All right. Um, don't want to hog all the question and answer space here, but, but I mean, absolutely, there's a lot of revenue being generated by police forces for themselves. In some American states, the state government has said, to prevent this from happening, from motivating the police, we're going to use those assets only for the school system. So anything gets seized goes to the schools. And then what the federal government does to those states, they go to the police, look, charge them under federal law and we'll give you half. And so there's a real corruption of the justice system. And absolutely policing for pro or prisons for profit is also a big issue. There's an article recently about how the Conservative Government of Canada has been looking at privatizing our prisons uh, to save money. And in many American states, companies like Geo Group that are big, make a lot of money off imprisoning people, they go to these states and they go, we'll run your prisons for you, no problem, we'll save you a ton of money. Can you just guarantee us a 90% occupancy rate for the next decade or two? If you can do that, hey, we'll be great. And the idea that we're basing our, our imprisonment and policing decisions on the bottom line profit margin for multinational corporations and not on like actual justice principles is a very dangerous road to go down. And my friend Mark Emery, who's in a prison right now in Yazoo, Mississippi, that's a government run prison, but he spent some time in a privatized prison as well. And seeing his journey through the justice system helped teach me a lot about how awful those privatized prisons are and the harm and the danger they cause. And Mark, like many others, contracted MRSA while he was in a privatized prison and that kind of stuff you know whatever you think of someone being in jail contracting a incurable lifelong ailment which many people get limbs amputated or die from that should not be a result of going to prison so there's a lot of issues there um, 
The last question here we have here is, how can we get this issue on the ballot for this year's provincial election? And these are all questions for me, so sorry, gang. But, um, but our, our referendum system in British Columbia is ridiculous. It's totally separate from the provincial elections. It's totally separate from municipal elections. It's its own, in, its own beast. Now, Christy Clark could call for a referendum any time that she wanted to. Our government can call for one whenever they want to test the will of the people, you know? So they could certainly put this on the ballot if they wanted to, but there's no indication at all that they're going to do that. Our referendum system has fixed election dates every three years in September. No one knows this because we never have referendums they just passed by, but they're scheduled for every three years in September. So the last one was 2011. The next referendum date is September 2014. And so that's why we've had this approach of kind of going at things with a long-term goal, because whether we had all 400,000 400, signatures in our hand now or a year from now, the referendum still happens in September 2014. And so that, that's how that works. But I mean, I would certainly love it if the provincial government would call a referendum, or better yet, just acknowledge all the poll results that have been coming in for the last couple of years, showing that British Columbians want to change the marijuana laws. We don't like the way they are now, and we want to see something different happen. Uh, so if anybody else has any questions they want to ask, other than the cards that were given in, or I think okay, we're all... Could I make a comment? Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead, Joy. Uh, that might work? Cool, might work, too. Yeah, there you go. Um, this isn't an election issue as Dana's is, but we are still hopeful, and I'm just one of those real optimistic people that will never give up, um, that our MLAs will strike a committee, and that's what we want them to do, to set the parameters of a, a medical cannabis uh, program for pr the province. We put a lot of hours into um, getting people to write letters to their MLAs, and we were hoping something could happen before the the Legislative Assembly rose, and it didn't. But I found out today, that through all of our hours, and I mean, we really put hours in. When you have health issues, it takes its toll. There were only 11 MLAs in the whole province of 85 that received letters from their constituents just even addressing this issue. So if you um, have the ability and the desire you know my cards over there as well as the one sheet with summary of, of what we're talking about but just write your MLAs that make such a difference and I know being in you know politics for so long they do listen as they do to the petitions online which are new and we'll be getting that going too but write your MLA if you would like to see a provincial election or um, program and if they get enough they will talk and when you write them CC the health minister, the premier, your member of parliament, us if you think of it, and uh, Gordy Hogue is the MLA that I'm working with. So that's the only thing we can do before the election. Thank well, you. Absolutely, and, and pressuring our MLAs is very important before, during, and after this coming election. I think Mark wanted to address this a little bit first, and then I'll take your question. Yeah, just a couple things uh, regarding prisons for profit. Uh, the liberal government would put the end to that right away. Just to let you know, this is something that has been discussed amongst liberals. We're very disgusted with it, actually. It's a disgusting move. Uh, it goes against justice. Uh, secondly, regarding uh, the upcoming provincial election, if you guys want to get this on the ballot, I know politicians, and they don't like feeling uncomfortable, okay? Uh, show up at the all candidates meetings and the debates and raise these issues, you know? Every riding should have this issue raised because you know what? 75% of British Columbians want cannabis legalized. And that's a huge number. So get out there and just get under their collar, get under their skin, whether they're NDP or uh, BC Liberal, get under their skin. We're probably looking at an NDP government, so get under their skin specifically because they're a lot easier than the BC Liberals to get on board with this, just to let you know. We're not affiliated with them. It's the Liberal Party of Canada. <laughs> All right. No, so absolutely. yeah, get under their skin. Yeah, ab absolutely. That's great advice. And I just want to build on what Mark said. This prison stuff is not to be taken lightly. Um, and I'm happy to email you this. We received a copy of the federal government's cost analysis report on the new medical marijuana program. They're looking at it. Page 9, it says they expect 30% of the people with health issues that use medical marijuana will not be able to afford the new program costs. 
So I, as a patient, translate that as, oh, Mr. Harper, you're building jails. 30% of it would be filled with people like me. We need to stand up, and you need to do it now. Thank you. Absolutely. And you know, charging 8 to $10 a gram for that legal government-grown cannabis or that legal cannabis is absolutely an outrage. Now, we charge that price at our medical marijuana dispensary, but we're paying prohibition prices to get our medicine from growers who risk jail if they get caught. If you're growing it legally in a large scale with a government license, that stuff should be no more expensive than the world's finest tomatoes or the world's best lettuce. There's no reason to charge that much. What are they charging now for an ounce of uh, marijuana in Colorado, roughly? Last time you just said 100 bucks. I was hoping you were going to well, say that, not 200. Although even 250 is a lower price, perhaps, well, I mean, than it used like, to be. Or? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a it's a price war, and I mean, you're you're seeing the the best quality marijuana that's around for about 200 dollars an ounce on average. People often sometimes well, sometimes people say to me, well, if the government legalizes it, they're going to tax it hell to hell, and it's going to cost more than it does now. And I have to remind them, you're paying a big prohibition tax right now. You could tax cannabis quite heavily and still have the price be much lower than it is now. And, you know, certainly when alcohol was legalized, the price dropped and the quality increased. And I think we could expect the same for marijuana as well. I think I'll take this as the last question unless anybody else is really dying to ask them. Okay, I'll do one more after that, but I'll take you first. We'll give you stuff tonight to make up for that. All right, all right. You get your free button. Um, is, like, I know that you're looking to get it taken off the schedule, and, and I know that the taxing and, and having to pay it available to that way is great, but um, for patients who can't afford it and won't be able to afford it, is there a way I absolutely advocate that pe everybody should have the right to grow their own cannabis in their own home in some kind of safe and reasonable way with some kind of limit, although if you're a medical patient that needs more, you should be able to produce more. We tried with our legislation, because we're limited in what the province can do, we actually tried a few different versions of this law. We tried to do something that would allow people to have, like, you can grow six plants in your own home in some way, but because of the way the federal laws are written, we can't make regulations as a province around illegal activity. We can just tell our police to, to what their priorities should be. So we could have put something in there telling the police to no longer spend any time or resources investigating anybody <laughs> growing marijuana at all in the province. That probably wouldn't fly because that would become like a free-for-all. I don't think most British Columbians would go for that. So the, the limit of being able to start with possession but th this commission that we want to launch, I hope to be there and to be with that, and we will be advocating for the right of all British Columbians to grow a certain amount of cannabis, whether it's a number of plants. It makes more s sense to me to have like a square foot limit, perhaps, because in Colorado it's six plants, which is great. I bet some of them are learning how to grow the six biggest plants you ever saw, I imagine, anyways. But uh, I know I would under that limit. But either way, it doesn't really matter whether it's a plant limit or a square foot limit, but the idea that people should be able to grow their own in their own home. That also keeps the price down as well, because if the cost, most folks aren't going to bother growing their own marijuana if they can get a good quality product at a reasonable price. Some will, and they should have that right. But ultimately, if you can buy it, most people aren't going to bother. But as the price goes up, the more likely you are to go, well, I'm not paying that. I'm going to grow it myself. So I also think that having a certain amount of personal cultivation helps keep the price down and helps kind of spread it out as well. Uh, we'll take your question. Uh, the stress relief would, would be in terms of hard numbers, we're probably looking at 20 to 40 percent. It's, it's astonishing the load that gets pressed through the court system because of, of, of the federal prosecution right now. It's astonishing to me that the current uh, provincial government right now is shutting down courthouses, is trying to push people out of courthouses, and is blaming people, essentially blaming people for being in the process. And the idea in this new white paper that's just been released is that if people just had more information, apparently, they'd enter a guilty plea earlier. Well, I can tell you, as an absolute guarantee, 
that people in the face of the new legislation that the feds have created ought to be entering not guilty pleas and fighting this, fighting this, fighting this. The result is going to be a greater load in the court. And this is one of the things that Dana made in terms of a point that I couldn't figure because our premier has been so quick to dismiss the issue of marijuana as a federal issue and none of her business. But it seemed to me that it was just her voice that I heard the other day talking about the closure of the Jericho Beach rescue facility. And it seemed to me from law school that too was a federal issue, but she was quick to speak to that one. Yes. Ends up in the court system, and the whole idea is to get the police to go after criminals. Absolutely. Crime. Absolutely. You know, we've got real crime out there, and smoking dope is not real thing. That's the, that's the essential position that LEAP has taken from the very beginning, and, I, I, and I, I can hardly start to tell you the quality of personnel that we're talking about. We're talking about the deputy chief of LA. We're talking about the former chief of Boston. We're talking about the former chief of Seattle. We're talking about the, the, the head of the training facility who's a retired major in, in Baltimore, our executive director, Neil Franklin. The quality of the people that, who, who are coming forward and saying, this doesn't work free us up so we can do the proper job of police work, please, is astonishing. If people would start to listen to it, we'd move forward. This is a great initiative. It really is. Uh, so we're going to be having a, a follow-up meeting for our volunteers, for those of you who want to get involved. Uh, that's going to be at the same location right here on the 30th of March, which is a Saturday, from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. The point of that meeting, and I hope that if you're excited about what you heard today, you'll bring a few friends with you as well, but the point of that meeting is to get people trained up a little bit as volunteers to find out more about how you can get involved in this campaign and to help give you the skills and materials to actually get involved and make a difference. And you know, we've got crews working all around British Columbia. We need a lot more, certainly, but we've got dedicated people working very hard, collecting signatures, getting people into our database so that we have a big head start when we come to September and we're able to really move this thing forward. Because although we've got a lot of good things on our side, just the logistical effort of getting these signatures in place in that 90-day period is a phenomenal amount of work that we need to be done. But like it was mentioned, you know, you get bragging rights. Let's not have to tell our kids and grandkids, oh, sorry we didn't legalize marijuana. I know it's been going on a long time. Maybe you guys can get to it. Let's be able to tell them, you know, we worked hard. We sacrificed. We made a big effort for Sensible BC. And when, we ca when I cast that ballot in September 2014 to change the marijuana laws in British Columbia, that was the best vote we I ever cast. And let's be able to tell our kids and grandkids that we've changed things in our province and in our country so they don't have to be worried about getting charged or arrested for what herbal medicine they use or for what plants they might choose to grow in their garden. We have a special opportunity now but you know, people thought marijuana was about to be legalized in the 1970s. And everybody thought, oh, it's just around the corner. We had a political consensus with Joe Clark, conservative, Pierre Trudeau, liberal, Jimmy Carter, American president. People, the Ladane Commission had come out. Everyone thought it's just a matter of time, just a matter of, of, of it's going to happen. It's inevitable. And a whole generation has gone by, and these things have not changed. And now the cycle's come around again. We've got that same kind of consensus. We've got that same kind of opportunity to change these laws in the next couple of years and I'm afraid if we miss this chance here it could be a long time coming before we get that chance again you know and uh, and so we got to take advantage of this now make the effort it's only six months yeah go ahead thank you very much <laughs> just across the walkway here okay so that's where we're actually beginning at the how room right that's okay right on Thank you very much. So I hope to see some of you folks here. So what we've got this card, so what we want you to do is to tear off or bring this little part with you to remind you where to come, and then sign up one of your friends, right? That's what we're doing this time, signing up one of your friends. So bring this back with someone else's name and information on it to help build up our database, or better yet, grab some of our sign-up forms and sign up a couple of dozen of your friends and family and coworkers and neighbors. Talk about this campaign to other people. You know, advertising and newspaper articles and editorials are all great, but what really convinces somebody is somebody else who they know and 
love, talking to them one-on-one -on -one and discussing this issue with them and bringing it up in a personal kind of level. That's what makes change. That's what gets people interested in volunteering and helping and becoming part of this campaign. We've got a great crew here in Vancouver and or in, in the lower, greater lower mainland. We've got a great crew working all around the province. I hope you'll join us in this campaign so that we can change these laws here in British Columbia once and for all through the Sensible BC campaign. I want to thank you all very much for coming. I want to thank our panel for their amazing insights and benefits. And I hope to see most or all of you back here on March 30th at 1.30 p.m. in the Howe Room just over there. And bring a few friends so we don't have such an empty room. But you know, don't be discouraged because it doesn't take a lot of people. It takes people working hard and passionately, energetically. This is a start. We're planting a seed now and this seed will grow into a wonderful tree of freedom. How's that for a metaphor for you there? So thank you very much. We'll be here if you want to chat one-on-one -on -one afterwards. But thank you for coming. Have a great night.